Okay, um, so there's been one other very big development recently, which is contextual word representations. Um, so word meanings vary enormously in context, and our current word vectors seem not to deal with that. But actually, if you think about what we had for these language models, that inside the language models we had these hidden st states, and you could think of these as like, well, maybe this is the meaning of the word in context. And so people have now exploited that idea to say, well, maybe we could just train very large neural language models and let them provide the meaning of words in context. And that will be a very useful representation that be could be used for all kinds of tasks. In particular, it has this great beauty because these very large neural language models are something that you can train without any labeling. We don't have to have a labeling factory. All we need to do is take large amounts of text, learn a big neural language model, and then sort of feed those representations into a network that we've built for some tasks, such as the named entity recognition I mentioned earlier. And so that's proved to be a super successful idea. So using that idea suddenly gave new life in which for all tasks, whether it was named entity recognition, question answering, co-reference decisions, sentiment analysis, it would lift up the performance of models to well above the preceding state of the art. And so that then, um, led into people trying to build bigger and bigger um, language mod contextual word representations from language models of this sort. And so this is the part um, where things get into industrial scale and how much you can do this depends on how big your computing budget is. Um, but it's not really, so big, bigness helps for something, but it's not that the ideas are complex, the ideas are really quite simple. Um, there's still one idea I haven't really got to cover, which is once things went on from Elmo, people moved on to a different architecture, which was a transformer architecture. That's an interesting different architecture, which I'm not going to have time um, to cover um, today. Um, the interesting thing about it is that rather than having a recurrent network, recurrent networks tend to be slow and that is problematic. So it replaces that um, with only using attention. So it's again reusing the same ideas. It makes use of a deep architecture vert vertically, so it uses the same idea of having skipping residual connections. But doing that then works brilliantly well. And so that's then led to a new model of language, contextual word representations with BERT. Um, and again, that's then improving our results further. So word vectors helped, BioSTMs helped, these kind of representations um, help again to move things on further. So I'd better pretty much stop there. What I'd like to say is, you know, I, I agree that in the last few years there's been too much benchmark chasing in systems development and both vision and natural language processing. But on the other hand, it's amazing the speed of progress that this has brought, and it really has led to the development of a few novel but extremely powerful architectural ideas. Maybe they were de developed by craftsmen who were thinking about what are new architectures I could use to make things better, rather than sort of from some deep foundational math or something. But these ideas have actually been incredibly general and incredibly powerful and incredibly effective. And I think that that's actually been a really dramatic development and we should also appreciate that even as we look for more conceptual understanding of what some of the strengths of these methods are. Thank you. So trying to stick to schedule, let's have one question. We'll have a whole panel discussion which can bring more questions about anything this morning. Please. Hi, that was a wonderful talk. I, um, I appreciate your comment at the end that you know, these particular benchmark tasks have driven a few very beautiful ideas that are giving lots of performance. Um, but these all are kind of prediction supervised tasks in the end. And I wonder if you have something to say about how we could extend what's given by these benchmarks to realms that are more unsupervised, particularly, you know, scientific realms where we don't have labels, where we, you know, want to make progress, but it is in a way that will require a lot of deep collaboration between domain experts and machine learning experts because the evaluation function is so unclear. 
Um, I think the notion of supervised versus um, unsupervised is very tricky because I think a huge amount of the opportunities to do things is to use effectively self-supervision where you use data that's available in the world to define your own prediction challenges which you then you learn using the tools of supervised learning. So these um, contextual language models that I was mentioning at the end, the Elmo and the bird, you know, enormously powerful. They're not only good Good for raising your benchmark task performances, but they're also proved to just learn a lot of the structure of language as they work. Now, you know, in one sense, they're sort of unsupervised. There's no one working labeling in a cubicle, right? You're just taking large piles of, of text. On another sense, the way that they are learned is by sort of just inventing your own supervision problem. You're sort of saying, okay, I've got words one to seven. Let me try and predict what the eighth word is going to be. And you learn that using the tools of supervised learning learning. And I think everywhere you look in the world, and for all kinds of scientific data as well, you can use exactly that same trick of defining your own supervision by just looking at what happens in the world, by looking at connections between adjacent things, by looking across time, and that's a very profitable way forward.